Martina Castro is proof of what is possible when you just start doing the thing you love. She's the CEO and founder of Adonde Media, which she calls a globally minded podcast production company. She also co founded and produced Radio Ambulante, NPR's first ever Spanish language narrative journalism audio show. Throughout, Martina has challenged herself to grow as a storyteller and digital media leader, earning respect from colleagues and contracts with big names like the popular Duolingo app and the influential TED Speaker series. In short, she's doing what she loves and doing it her way. Martina, thank you so much for being here. It is a great honor. Oh. <laughs> a great honor. I'm like, go on. <laughs> I was looking through your 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 roster. I mean, goodness, you interviewed Dolores Huerta. I was like, I can't believe I'm going to be on this podcast. This is this is a you are so silly. <laughs> it's no. a highlight. You're a digital audio queen. Oh, uh, I don't know. It Depends on who you talk to. People I talk to. Julika has a very high standard, so that's Julika true. Signed off on that. That's is it then strange or totally normal to be on someone else's podcast? Completely strange. Okay. I mean, I, I still get a little like flustered and nervous. But I think it's important to know what it feels like to be on this side. Otherwise, you have zero sympathy for the people you you go out and, and interview. And um, I think it makes me a more <laughs> empathetic mm-hmm. storyteller. You start as an intern at NPR. Mm-hmm. That's your entree into all of this. Yeah. I knew I needed to get an internship. I was, you know, an overachiever in school, and so I knew I had to follow the rules. And it's okay, I got to get an internship. And so I applied for the NPR internship, and I didn't get it the first time. I got one in another different radio journalism program. And then three days after college uh, ended, I started my internship at NPR, and that just kicked everything off. It was really lucky. You realize how lucky you are in the sense that most people don't just stumble into their passion that early in in their career. It's shocking. Maybe I'm just personally envious as someone (laughs) whose career has taken lots of twists and turns that you started there. But what's so interesting to me about your story is that you really love audio in a way that I— it took creating this podcast for me to appreciate what that even means, right? Oh, my goodness. It was such a luxury. I mean, that was my school. I, I went to I, I everyone asked me how I learned this and I said on the job can I ask you about that yeah. though? because I I too I like I don't have a journalism degree so I learned sitting in a newsroom all of those things there are moments where I like I wish I had that foundation do you ever have that moment yes all the time I wish that I had had a little bit of that foundation so that I could more confidently enter some rooms, um, especially in the beginning of my career. I think in the beginning, it was really, really rough to be an outsider. But at the same time, I, it, it was such a such a gift to be in the room. Looking back at my career, it might look like a straight line, but I wasn't even sure I wanted to stay in journalism back then. And it wasn't because of the— What were you going to go do? Anything else, because I wasn't sure— Look, at my internship, my NPR internship, I mean, this is months after I've graduated from college, um, I got sick or something, and uh, I suffer from migraines. And uh, I, I had to call in sick. And the executive producer at the time, who no longer works there, brought me into her office. And she said, look, I don't know if you have what it takes to make it in this industry, because this industry is tough. And it was it was hard. There were a lot of tough moments. And I was starting at the quote unquote top. And NPR, you know, was it was the top. It was it was the best. And if I was I had to succeed and not mess up that opportunity. Right. And so there's so much pressure that I was like, maybe this isn't for me. Like mm-hmm. I want to have fun doing what I do. I don't want to be so exhausted all the time. <laughs> I uh, want to have ideas and have them be validated by the people around me. And, you know, there's a million reasons why I probably wasn't being validated in that time. I mean, I was really young. Who knows? My ideas probably weren't very good. But I discovered the brand of journalism and storytelling that I wanted to do by chance and just in time. Meaning what? What happened? Meaning... I left NPR. (laughs) 
It was a bold move. I learned so much. I'm so grateful for that opportunity. I hate talking, like, bad about it, but I have to be honest. It wasn't the environment for me that was going to make me my best self. Mm-hmm. And it was the beginning of me leaving journalism. And I left and went to San Francisco and worked at KALW. And I found my best self there, thanks to people who really trusted me to be a leader, who trusted me to figure things out on my own, who created a culture of yes, and who uh, inspired fun and creativity in in a situation where we were also striving for excellence. And that was the beginning of me figuring out that I could actually make a work environment that, in my image, rather than having to mold myself to a work environment that uh, wasn't the right fit for me. When it comes to fertility, lots of us have been told, just wait and see. But now we have tools to help us plan and track everything, our finances, our steps. Why is this one thing still wait and see? That's why Modern Fertility was created. It's the easy and affordable way to test your fertility hormones at home with a simple finger prick. Mail it in with a prepaid label and get your personalized results within 10 days. Traditional testing with your doctor can cost over $1,000, but Modern Fertility only costs $159, and you get the same information. And if you go to modernfertility.com slash Latina, you can get $20 off your test. Plus, if you have an HSA or FSA, you can use that money on Modern Fertility. You'll get insights into how many eggs you have, hormone levels, and any reproductive red flags. The results go in-depth into what every hormone means, and you can also talk one-on-one with a fertility nurse to review your results and options for next steps. Right now, Modern Fertility is offering our listeners $20 off the test when you go to modernfertility.com slash Latina. That means your test will cost $139 instead of the hundreds or thousands it could cost at a doctor's office. Get $20 off your fertility test when you go to modernfertility.com slash Latina. modernfertility.com slash Latina. Radio Ambulante, which is one of the hardest things for me to get out of my mouth in Spanish. So thanks a lot. Sorry. <laughs> like it's that my, initial R, right? Like <laughs> it's the R, but then it's it's like it, no, it's like it's the vowel <laughs> consonant vowel. Anyhow, my husband's favorite podcast. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. Thank you. He, he is a native Spanish speaker, so I think it makes him feel like it's like a warm hug around him. Um, I'm not at all salty about the fact that you've produced my husband's favorite podcast <laughs> when I have a podcast. Um, When your co-founders approached you with the idea, what was the original pitch? It was um, basically let's make this American life but in Spanish. And let's reflect the true diversity of the stories we have to tell and not have them be so um, so one-dimensional. And it was just at the right time I had really helped— grow the news department at KLW. I was the managing editor at the time. And I really was ready to create something. And I felt like I had enough skills to really contribute to a team. And um, at the time, I think I was the only one with radio experience and uh, and audio editing experience and sound design experience. So I became the senior producer and mixed all of our stories uh, in my free time. And uh, it was just so exciting. It was such an exciting moment. What were the growing pains? For the show or for me? Hmm. Both. <laughs> Start with the show, okay. and then I'll come back to you. Um, well, from the beginning, we just didn't have very many resources. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I think we signed up for three years. I remember my co-founders being like, let's all, like, promise we're going to give it three good years. And I think we were in the fifth year (laughs) or the sixth when we (laughs) finally signed on with NPR. It's one of those labors of love that you don't want to let go of and you believe in so deeply that you know it can become the thing you've imagined it becoming. But it just got harder to grow without, without institutional support. And so much of what I'm doing now with Adonde Media that I had begun 
chatting and dreaming about with my co-founders of Radio Ambulante. And so it's it's not it's it was a natural digression for me. Um and I think it happened just when it when it needed to. And um I'm just I'm so impressed and proud that they've kept going with the show and I'm so so thrilled it still exists out in the world that whatever pain I felt in the beginning or sort of like sense of anguish that I couldn't still be part of it is way overshadowed by my appreciation of it being in the world and and my appreciation of my co-founders who still are giving it so much life. It has evolved way further than um, I was prepared to take it, to be honest. So. Right, and I think you need to know the difference. Yeah, It's a hard exactly. thing to know sometimes. You produce in English and Spanish. Your bio is available on your website in English and Spanish. You keynote at industry events in English, but then you also help found Podcasteros, which is an organization for Spanish language podcasters. Because your work is so bilingual, I assumed that you were like always fully bilingual, but that's not totally the case. When you grew up speaking Spanish. Yeah, like my official first language is Spanish. So three-year-old Martina only spoke Spanish at home. Mm -hmm. Then the moment I entered preschool, my mother realized that I was struggling, like, in, in just to understand, and she freaked out and and put me in front of the television, and I learned English with Minnie and Mickey Mouse and cartoons in the morning, and quickly through kindergarten became more fluent in of English. Course. And then it was my, and but people ask me and I feel way more fluent. My native language is English. Yeah, for sure. Can I say something else about it? Yeah. Which is, I think is important to say. I am not. It's just so emotionally fraught for me. Me too. Me too. And that's what I want to get across because it's, it sounds like, okay, let's wrap that up with a bow. Martinez bilingual. Not true. I make these minor mistakes that throw people off. Like, wait a second. They're minor insofar as. Give me an example. Oh, the subjunctive. Every once in a while, <laughs> I'll just, you know, I'll say it when I'm not supposed to or, or, or miss it when I, I shouldn't. And um, otherwise, perfect, right? And then all of a sudden, I, I don't say the subjunctive right. And so native speakers will be like, huh? What? That's weird. Uh, but it's, it's so small that they don't correct me. And therefore, I have now fully ingrained these errors in my brain. And I know that I will go out in the world, and I, especially formal letters on email, or I'll go out in the world and speak in public, and I know I'm going to make these mistakes. Mm-hmm. And I feel like an imposter. You know, I'm not fully bilingual. I, ca- I can never proofread fully, fully a a script. I would prefer to have a professional translator proofread it. I'm making a living off of right. by being bilingual. And so it's a huge imposter syndrome contributor for me. But I think it's so important to say this out loud. Every time I do, there's someone, especially if I'm on stage or I'm speaking in front of uh, an audience, there's always someone out there who feels identified with me because the language is such an, a barrier, but also a door to, to this part of yourself. And how dare we re- remove that for someone? Because it's, it, it's just not, it's just not fair that we've had to grow up with that, this feeling that we don't belong if we don't speak well enough, or, you know, somehow, we can only belong if we we can fake the accent or we can fake being <laughs> that person. You know, like I, it's been a part. Of, it's been a theme of my entire life. It's my responsibility to go out and represent the people like us that are not fully one or fully mm. the other that live in this middle space. This is what it is to be bilingual. Truly, it means you don't always understand everything. There's always something you're missing. You're constantly code switching. And you're never fully one or the other. And that's awesome. That's the thing I want to get to and where I'm trying to. I want to be a proponent of that because I've suffered the other thing my entire life, which is, oh, no, you better fit in one or the other. You know, like I was American at school. I was Uruguayan at home. I was, you know, it's just, it it was a whole. 
I know. Constantly. Really, yeah, moving. constant. It constant. Is there something that's getting in the way of your happiness or that's preventing you from achieving your goals? I have found that talking with someone can make a big difference, but sometimes the logistics, like finding the right person and the time to connect, make things complicated. BetterHelp Online Counseling connects you with a professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. You can get help on your own time and at your own pace. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist. BetterHelp's licensed professional counselors specialize in everything from depression to relationships to complicated family dynamics, self-esteem, grief, you get it. And if you're not happy with your counselor for any reason, you can request a new one at any time. They even have financial aid for those who qualify. Best of all, it's an affordable option. Latina to Latina listeners get 10% off your first month with the discount code LATINA. So why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash Latina. Fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor. That's betterhelp.com slash Latina. In 2016, you moved to Santiago, Chile. Why? Yeah, well, I actually moved to Chile because my partner at the time was not very happy with with the life in Uruguay. He couldn't find a good job, and we weren't ready to come back to the United States. We kind of were addicted to this amazing, liberated feeling of being um, untethered. abroad. Yeah, yeah, untethered, and being part of this weird expat community of people who are not in their own home uh, country. And we fell in love with Chile in a trip that we did. We we traveled by in a van, lived in a van. <laughs> <laughs> for three and a half months and traveled the entire coastline of Chile before getting to Uruguay for my Fulbright. And we said, let's just go back and live there. And I was like, well, maybe I should just start a production company. Uh, I knew I wanted to start more podcasts in Spanish and in Latin America. And uh, so I pitched this uh, crazy idea to start up Chile, and they said yes. What is Startup Chile? Startup Chile is a state-sponsored incubator. Uh, where and accelerator, where they uh, started about five to seven years ago, um, wanting to become the Silicon Valley of the South. They said, "Look, we to do this need to import knowledge and import um, entrepreneurial." ambition and skill and mm. knowledge. And so they said, well, let's bring entrepreneurs from around the world here to Chile to work on their companies. We'll give them money for free, equity-free funding. I feel like half I of mean, my listeners insane. are like pressing pause, <laughs> yeah. running to their computer. It's <laughs> incredible. I could not recommend it enough. And I was part of a program called um, the, the S Factory, which is for just female-founded companies. And it was uh, 26 badass, you know, female CEOs and founders from all over the world. It's a smaller, it's a shorter program. It's for four and a half months. We just had to get to an MVP by the end. And uh, they MVP. basically, a minimum viable product. And so like a prototype. For me, it was a pilot of a podcast. But uh, how did your time there then shape your thinking about what it was you were trying to do? Well, first, it was just so validating because I don't have a business background. You know, I'm, I even though I worked on Radio Ambulante and creating Radio Ambulante, my, my whole role in that company was to be the, the, the producer. So um, I wasn't really involved in the business side of things. Um, but, you know, that first day when they introduced me as CEO of Adonde Media, I had just made that name up. I mean, I literally couldn't believe what was happening. But... There they were calling me that, and I was like, okay, I guess that's what I am. Then they taught me all of these things, like the lingo and and how does it, how do you make a pitch deck, and um, how do you validate your product, and how do you go out and talk to your uh, potential customers, and um, and then three days after I started, Duolingo called me to see if I would help them make their their Spanish podcast. How did I, they find you? Thanks to my co-founders at Radio Ambulante. They had gone to them first, I think. That was the story. And um, and they recommended me. I was about to ask you, what was your first pitch like? That your first pitch was incoming. I know. We made a pilot together. And then, and then I mean, the 
startup funding really made it possible for me to get to a point where we were we had a first season approved. So you've um, I mean you've worked with Duolingo, you've worked with Ted, NPR, Vice News. That's pretty fast growth for a company that's been around two years. It's a fast growth for a company that's been around two years in an industry that is expanding so rapidly that it it must be hard to even know how to measure growth. Correct. It is. I it's so hard. People are like, oh, what's your five-year plan? I was like, I I shouldn't have one because if I did, I'd be pretending to know what's gonna be happening mm-hmm. in five years and this industry is gonna change in one. So it's very short-term goals. But I knew in the beginning, I'm just one person. I have a ton of knowledge and contacts. I saw so much potential of of giving what I have from the U.S. and from that experience, these now 15 years that I've been in this industry, to a whole new continent of burgeoning podcast producers. And so I, I knew that that had to be part of the calculation and that use those contacts to go for the clients that get it. At that time, no one was talking about podcasts outside the United States or podcasts not in English. And I was like, okay, well, I think there are companies out there that understand this just by their very nature. And I made a list. Ted was on that list. Duolingo was on that list. It was a kind of a combination, these three tiers of building up the producers by finding the clients that want to make the products for the audiences that don't even know what they don't have yet. I mean, this I learned at Radio Ambulante. Everyone looked at us like we were kind of crazy when we wanted to make a podcast for Latin America. They're like, nobody nobody in Chile cares about what's happening in Argentina. Nobody in our Colombia wants to hear a story from Peru. Um, well, we're like, well, we do. And we think that if we make it, people are going to want it. And that's just kind of been the principle that I've used. You're doing two things at once, though. You're both producing audio stories, which is a thing it seems you have a mastery of. But then you're also a CEO, which, as you said, you didn't go to business school. I mean, you are learning on the job what have been the growing pains, where are the gaps? I think about them every day. I think that this is what's incredible about being a an entrepreneur, I would say, is that you have to get super comfortable staring at your uh, deficiencies in the face. Because if you're not really comfortable looking at where you're missing the mark, you're not growing and you're you're not cut out for this. Um, you you just con- made conscious of it constantly. I'm like, go on, tell me. Tell okay, me what are they? All those what are they? Okay, all those deficiencies. Let's I mean, get I, into it's, it. It's funny. I think of myself, for example, as an assertive person, but I realize some of the few times I've been fully in charge of something, I actually have trouble pulling the trigger. Like, I so want to make sure that I've gathered all of the opinions and all of the analysis that sometimes I can become paralyzed. That surprised me about myself until I got into that position. Yeah. I'm an optimizer, so I want to know all the options. I want to entertain all of the options before I choose one of them. This is just my nature. I uh, maybe am overly collaborative in my decision-making process. I don't like making decisions by myself. I don't like it. I, I, I literally don't even think I'm making the right decision until I hear myself say it out loud and discuss it with another person. So things changed tremendously when I brought on uh, my brother, (laughs) Gonzalo, uh, is now the head of operations, and he joined me early last year in 2019. And that was just a game changer for me to just have someone that I could say, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And we now approach all sales and all hiring and all business decisions together, and at least I have another brain um, to throw ideas around with. What have you sacrificed to get here? That's interesting how I don't really think about these things. Um, I have like an inner mechanism. Who knows if it's like an editor for all the decisions I've ever made to get to a place where I don't feel that feeling. I've really sacrificed much. I don't 
think I... I don't think I identify with that feeling. I mean, sure, there are things that I... Mm, like, in my personal life, wish I had done a little differently. Um, I sacrificed a lot of tranquility and peace. Uh, I exercised this mode of work and um, of navigating life where I felt like I had to be stressed all the time, that I had to be go, go, go all the time, that I had to push myself and never feel like I was enough. And in a way, it's like this sick sort of addiction that you become. You, you think that you got ahead because you were so mean to yourself in your head. Because you pushed, because you weren't satisfied, because, you know, you you uh, you never let yourself feel full. You never let yourself feel satisfied or proud or like you made it. I mean, even things that I did well, I would get off like a, I would literally get off the stage of a, an amazing speech and just I would revel for literally maybe 30 seconds and how it felt and then turn around and say, God, I wish I had done da 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 It makes me an amazing editor, but it's not great <laughs> for, Ooh. you know. Yeah, no, I do know. I do. So if I could go back and do it with just a little more joy and self-love, oh, man, I'd do it in a heartbeat. I also love that neither of us are willing to actually implement it right away. We're like, yeah, that me of the past, I would cut her a break. But that me of the future, like, I'm going to keep pounding on her because she, she, she better to know work. she's not good yeah, enough. Exactly. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> oh, right. I'm working on it. I'm in therapy to do this, like, to try and... Do you me, know, learn a new way. Let me know if that works. Let me know the name of your therapist. Um, Martina, thank you so much for doing this. Oh my gosh, you're so welcome. It's an so honor to fun. be here with you. Thank you. Thank you, as always, for joining us. Latina to Latina is executive produced and owned by Juleka Lentigua Williams and me, Alicia Menendez. Cedric Wilson is our mixer. Emma Forbes is our assistant producer. We love hearing from you. We really do. Email us at hola at latinatolatina.com. And remember to subscribe or follow us on Radio Public, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you're listening. And please leave a review. It is one of the quickest ways to help us grow as a community. Finally, be sure to follow us on Instagram and on Twitter. We're at Latina to Latina. <laughs>